uh, one of my grad school professors said that whenever you start a presentation, like this, you should always say something like short and funny or uh, related to like what's going on with the weather uh, to try to bond with the audience. And uh, after two years, I still haven't figured out how to really do that on Zoom. Uh, so I guess I'm just gonna have to start the presentation right here. Uh, I wanted to talk about riparian natural communities and uh, starting, I guess, with the, the lens of the mission of the Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department where I work. And that's the, the conservation of fish, wildlife, plants, and their habitats for the people of Vermont. And uh, what that is then is uh, this 24 to 43,000 different species here in Vermont. And as you can see on this uh, pie chart here, you know, most of these species are not vertebrate animals and they're not even vascular plants. It's groups like fungi and uh, mosses and invertebrates, lichens, uh, species that are cryptic, hard to understand, uh, poorly studied, and most of them, uh, or many of them probably don't even have names. So how do we protect all of these different species that uh, collectively comprise uh, Vermont's biodiversity? Fortunately, this is not a new problem to conservation science. And there's uh, a well-recognized approach for this that's uh, designed around being an, e an efficient way to conserve many species. And it's called the coarse filter, fine filter approach to conservation. Uh, and it's essentially by choosing coarser, bigger features uh, to conserve many species. So if you can conserve uh, places like this alluvial shrub swamp on the photo in, in the photo on the left there. Uh, you can serve common species like speckled alder, uh, false hellebore, and then also probably or sometimes you'll conserve rare species like same thing for a black spruce swamp. Uh, conserve black spruce, the boreal species, the herbs, uh, and then uh, rare and uncommon things like spruce grouse or this uh, moss, splachnum moss, that only grows on uh, deer and moose dung in Vermont. So I wanted to dive into like, what exactly are those, well, sorry, uh, backing up. The, the way of doing that coarse filter, fine filter approach originally was to use natural communities. Uh, and in Vermont, we have a, a robust natural community classification and so I wanted to dive into what are natural communities and then what are the natural communities uh, found in Vermont's riparian zone. So first of all, here's the definition of a natural community, an interacting assemblage of organisms, their physical environment, and the natural processes that affect them. So it's, it's the plants, it's the animals, it's the soil, it's the wind, uh, everything uh, working together to create uh, what is at a particular place. We describe 97 different natural community types in Vermont. They're described in the book, Wetland, Woodland, Wildland. Uh, an updated version of, of that was released in 2019. There's uh, several different uh, riparian natural communities. There's five different floodplain forest types. Uh, one that's new in this edition of the book. There's 12 shoreline communities, and those can be upland and wetland. And then there's uh, alluvial shrub swamps. And I wanted to kind of go through each of those in turn. Floodplain forests are probably familiar to many or maybe everyone here. Uh, the two most common floodplain forest types in Vermont are the silver maple ostrich fern floodplain forest and silver maple sensitive fern floodplain forest. Very similar forests with uh, tall arching uh, silver maples and very little shrub layer and then a very distinct fern layer, either the ostrich fern or the sensitive fern. They're distinguished by those ferns and really the, the ferns are where they are because of the different physical settings of each community. The ostrich fern floodplain forest is on the natural levee that's next to the river where the floodwaters come up and the sandy coarse sediments get deposited first. And then the uh, sensitive fern floodplain forest is in the, the back uh, behind that lateral levee where the soils are siltier. So the physical setting shapes the natural community and it also provides a way to help predict what natural communities might be in a spot that has been cleared or otherwise disturbed. 
and it's it's just always great to look at photos of the different uh, things that occur in these natural communities. Uh, the uh, ostrich fern fiddlehead, which we'll all be looking for soon, I imagine. This is a, a very rare plant in Vermont, green dragon, that's found in floodplain forests. It's related to uh, Jack in the pulpit. This is gray's sedge, an uncommon plant. And the blue gray gnat catcher, which is associated with these two floodplain forests. So those are Vermont's two most common floodplain forests. The next one I wanted to describe is uh, new for the new edition of Wetland Woodland Wildland. The, the natural community itself, it's not like it's new out there in nature, it's just new that we've given it a name and described it. Boreal floodplain forest. It's found in the coldest parts of the state, really only up in the northeastern uh, portion of the state. And this map, uh, if anything, probably overstates the range of this natural community. It's characterized by a mix of hardwood and softwood uh, tree species in the canopy, uh, and often a very uh, open edge to the floodplain forest uh, right along the river, uh, which I think is due to ice scour and uh, maybe the, the ice uh, blocks settling onto the edge of the river up and out over onto the land. Uh, this is Steam Mill Brook in Walden. In Vermont, this community tends to be on small uh, to mid-sized streams and rivers, I think mostly because those are the ones in uh, our cold settings when our bigger rivers are just in the uh, warmer valleys, so this community is less likely to occur. Here's an example along the Nalhegan River. It's a, it's a really neat mix of species, I think. It's balsam fir, black ash, black cherry, white spruce, yellow birch, northern white cedar. I think the northern white cedar is uh, just a really neat tree in general, and, and it's neat to see it in the floodplain setting. Here it is in, in Calendar Brook and Sutton. You can see some of the cedar canopies on the uh, left there. And, and cedar just has this cool thing. This is totally irrelevant to riparian areas, but when it, when it first uh, develops, it, it has these dimorphic leaves, the, the typical cedar leaves that you can see on either side, and then those sharp, pointy, single uh, needles that are also part of the, the cedar seedling. Uh, another species that the edge is speckled alder in those more open uh, parts of the floodplain forest. And uh, Canada lily, uh, nice flower of the floodplain forest. And wood turtle, again, is, is one that is in these areas. And Canada jay, uh, another species that's uh, rare in Vermont, restricted to the coldest areas and would use these floodplain forests. Uh, inside the, or right on the shores of rivers and streams and, and lakes and ponds as well, although I'm, again, I'm really only focusing on rivers right now, uh, there's shoreline natural communities. And these are places that I think tend to get overlooked and not really thought of always as natural communities. Uh, you can see a, a, several of them here, but they're, they're things like the river mud shore and the cobble shore, uh, or even an erosional bluff that can be naturally occurring. And these can be really, uh, really, really important for many different species. Here's a river shore grassland on the rest, West River uh, in Jamaica, I believe. And here is a cobble shore in the foreground and then a river shore grassland in the background uh, on this big bend in the West River. These support rare species like this, this one, the sand cherry which uh, doesn't look very distinctive, but it's a, a very rare species in Vermont. And it, as you can see, it grows in the uh, sediments between the cobbles. Here is uh, the uh, cobblestone tiger beetle, the specific natural community. Uh, that cobblestone tiger beetle, the larvae hide in the sand and uh, uh, grab other insects as they are passing by, and that's how they get their name. So the last natural community that I wanted to talk about is alluvial shrub swamp. And this is, I think, one that's not often thought of as a floodplain, but that's exactly the setting that it's in. Uh, here you can see it from the air along the Moose River in Victory. Uh, this sinuous, not very large, but can be high-powered river, uh, or many times it's on high-velocity rivers. Uh, 
or rivers that are flooding frequently enough to prevent the establishment of trees. Here's a small stream in Calus, and you can see the, the sediment deposition among all the uh, vegetation there. These places are really neat because they're, uh, I think, nature's place for our early successional, or many of our early successional uh, animal species, uh, like the yellow warbler or chestnut sided warbler and American woodcock. Uh, so places that are, are shrub dominated with speckled alder, willow, uh, many, many different willows, including uh, sometimes some rare willows. So that's just a, a real quick tour of, of several natural communities. And I, I hope that by showing those and uh, some of the species that are in them that I can get back to this point that if we are identifying and protecting different examples of all these different natural communities, we're without having to go species by species, making progress towards protecting all the different species, all these 20 to 40,000 different species here in Vermont. And then on top of that, if we can predict where certain natural communities might have occurred and work to restore them in those places, I think we can, we can make further efforts towards uh, pro providing habitat for all of these species and ensuring that they remain on the landscape. And just, a, I guess, a final note on that. Uh, natural communities are not static. They've changed over time, and they'll continue to change over time. Uh, we know from uh, paleoecological research, the study of the distribution of plants over time, that plants that we think of as growing together, like beech and hemlock, haven't always been in the same place. And on these maps, you can see 12,000 years ago, beech and hemlock uh, grew in totally different parts of the North American continent, whereas now they're common co-occurrence, or they, they co-occur commonly in our forest. So we know that species are going to move, and we have to uh, plan for that and allow for that to happen. And when I think about our network of forest blocks in Vermont, our patches of forest around the state, in many places, it's the riparian areas that are really tying those together. And that I think are going to be key for the long-term movement of species as they rearrange their distributions in response to climate change. So getting these, protecting these riparian natural communities and ensuring that they're connected I think is really critically important for climate resilience, for biodiversity. Uh, and that's work that is uh, elaborated on in some, uh, this effort that Vermont Fish and Wildlife and many partners worked on, Vermont Conservation Design. And I'd encourage you to, to look into that if you're interested in this topic uh, or the, the maps behind Vermont Conservation Design that are uh, available on the BioFinder website. Uh, so with that, I. I think I stuck to my 15 minutes and I want to say thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Bob. Really appreciate that presentation. And um, as I said, we're going to take questions for this session at the end of all three presentations. So we're going to jump right now to the next one and then folks can drop questions in the chat or we can ask them all together at the end. Um, Um, and I just want to say what a fascinating presentation, Bob, um, and it just goes to show that um, there's still so much to explore and new things to learn. Uh, let me share my screen real quick. Can you all see that? Yes. Okay, wonderful. Um, so as Allison mentioned, I'm a conservation fellow, and as part of my job, um, I sift through the scientific literature to help support and better understand some of the habitat management recommendations that we offer at Lake Champlain Sea Grant and um, Audubon, Vermont for bird habitat and healthy watersheds. And um, I think there's a lot of ecological concepts that we know to be true because they're long established and well supported in the literature. But um, sometimes it helps to go back and look at the data for context and just a, a perspective on um, how important these concepts are and to look at the numbers. So I've plucked out a few papers that um, are just a small subset of the enormous body of literature on this topic. 
in hopes to highlight some of the work that we've been doing and um, some of the science that supports that. So when thinking about some of the birds that use riparian areas, um, riparian being at the land water interface, this is really heavily dependent on what habitat we're talking about. Um, if the riparian area is a wetland area, we might see things like ducks and herons and the sedren. If uh, it's a really large river, we might see bald eagles, ospreys, kingfishers. If it's an open shrubby field with periodic flooding small creeks, we might see things like the woodcock or some species of sparrows or warblers. And then if it's, you know, a closed canopy mature forest stream, we might see other species of warblers, um, owls, vireos, woodpeckers, other birds. And a lot of birds use riparian areas in just part of their life cycle. They'll move around. And so when we're thinking about restoring the buffer area, you know, directly adjacent to these streams or wet areas, um, it's affecting a diverse group of birds and um, we just want to think about the surrounding landscape. So buffers um, provide food to birds in the early season. Some of the uh, first blooming vegetation species like willows um, bloom earliest in the season and provide nectar and pollen and then later in the season a lot of those species produce berries and seeds for, for birds. And um, importantly in buffers there are elevated levels of insects and a study found 1.2 to two times more abundant flying insects and in buffers than undisturbed shorelines. And buffers sort of serve as this terrestrial aquatic energy link where diet, fitness and reproductive success of a lot of birds depends on this area. Buffers are also crucial for migratory species. Um, especially when they're moving through and refueling on those resources. And buffers serve as corridors for connecting habitats and larger blocks. And then there are several species that uh, choose, to choose to breed in uh, riparian areas. On the flip side of that same coin, uh, birds provide benefits through seed dispersal. They can you know, help propagate some of those plants that you plant in your restoration area. They can provide pest control, gobbling up uh, insects and mosquitoes. They are good bioindicators of healthy functioning ecosystems. Um, and then they're pretty good ideal organisms for um, using as monitoring and assessments of post implementation outcomes, um, because we can use audio visual surveys to kind of reliably identify and hear them sing. Some of the questions we might ask when considering birds in our restoration plans are what site preparation is needed and why is that particularly important to birds? What native plants are best? Uh, how large does that buffer area need to be to show a benefit to birds? How long after planting can we expect to see them using it? And what other factors are at play? Um, site preparation usually involves the removal of invasive vegetation. And that gives native plants a chance to succeed and it gives our, our stems the best chance at survival. A uh, review by Nelson et al. Uh, looked at 128 studies in, of, in North America on impacts of invasive vegetation on birds. And they found that invasives negatively impact the overall number of birds in around a quarter of those cases. But more alarmingly, species richness decreased in 41.3% of the cases. And moreover, invasive species impact the quality and quantity of food more than nest site selection or nest survival. So as we dive a little deeper, uh, a study by Richard et al. compared caterpillar communities in invadive non-native hedgerows versus hedgerows dominated by native plants in an agricultural setting. And they found that similar plant species richness and actually more plant biomass was observed in those new hedgerows of invadive plants 
but 68% fewer caterpillar species, 91% fewer caterpillars overall, and 96% less caterpillar biomass was found in those invadive, invade, invaded hedgerows. So essentially invasive plants are a insect desert really. And a couple of common invasive species in the Lake Champlain Basin that are very pervasive are common buckthorn and Japanese honeysuckle. And as this relates to birds, common buckthorn fruits have a laxative property, which reduces the ability for birds to absorb nutrients and it helps spread that seed around. And then Japanese honeysuckle fruits are really sugary and not quite fatty enough compared to native fruits um, to sustain long migrations and long flights for birds. So essentially no insects and poor fruit means fewer birds. This is uh, one of the sites that Audubon and partners at VLT have been working on. This is at uh, formerly known uh, Nordic Farms in Charlotte, it's now um, Earthkeep Farm Common. And there's a riparian area here going through a shrubby habitat between two older fields. And this is preferred habitat for one of our priority species, the blue winged warbler here to nest. The problem with this habitat is that it's heavily invaded by Japanese honeysuckle, you can see by those uh, yellow leaves here. So we partnered together to mechanically remove that vegetation. And this is what it looked like the following year. And I believe about 800 stems of native stock went in the ground uh, last spring. And conservation biologist uh, at Audubon, Mark Labar, wanted to see what birds were using that habitat. So he put out his um, decoy. This is a wooden decoy of a related species, a golden winged warbler. And in our mist nets there, wouldn't you know, we found um, the exact same individual that had been banded there the year before, now using that managed habitat, which was pretty cool to see. This is another project at Philo Ridge Farm that uh, Audubon and partners, including the, the US Fish and Wildlife Service, are looking at a few acres in a riparian area on some farm fields um, to manage for wildlife. This past winter, we removed uh, buckthorn and did a stump treatment with herbicide using buckthorn blaster. And we hope to get some plants in the ground later this fall. So emphasizing the importance for um, native plants for birds, we know that there's a much, much higher insect biomass supported by native plants, and that's because they've co-evolved together for millions of years and developed these specializations. And this might mean certain insects have structural mouth parts that can only feed on certain shape flowers or they might have a chemical resistance to a naturally produced toxin in a native plant. And research out of um, Dr. Doug Tallamy's lab at um, the University of Delaware, he's a wonderful entomologist and uh, wildlife ecologist. He, his research has shown that over 90% of moth and butterfly caterpillars eat only a certain species of plant or a group of plants, which is why diversity is so important. Over 95% of terrestrial birds rear their young on insects, even if they are frugivore or granivores as adults. And that's because those squishy, soft caterpillars are super high protein and fat and perfect for feeding to chicks. Chickadees need 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars over the 16 to 18 days it takes to raise an average clutch to maturity. So that's a lot of caterpillars. Um, and it's important to note that not all native plants have the same biodiversity values. Some support more insects than others. So when thinking about birds, some of the best plants to implement and incorporate into your restoration plans are willows. They bloom super early in the season and they host over 370 species of caterpillars. Dogwoods are also really good. They provide berries that ripen throughout the summer. Speckled alder, again, is a really great one. And then any of the berry pr producing shrubs, especially viburnums, will always be a good way to go to support birds. Highbush cranberry, chokecherry, nannyberry, blueberry, spirea, winterberry, holly are all great choices. 
When it comes to trees, it really doesn't get much better than oaks. They support over 460 species of caterpillars. Cherries are not far behind with almost 400 species of caterpillars. And then maples, especially red maples, they bloom super early in the season. And some other really good choices might be yellow birch, hackberry, sycamore, American elm, red cedar, and cottonwood. As far as our question on how wide or how big a buffer should be in order to support birds, uh, like many questions in science, this depends on so many things. Um, but one study a few decades ago surveyed birds, mammals, and vascular plants in six mid-order streams right here in Vermont to try to determine the minimum width for biological ri richness conservation. And what they found was a buffer of at least 150 meters was needed to see 90% of the total bird species that they observed. However, a caveat to this, they saw extreme variation between streams and the species differed by site. So a main conclusion of this is that buffer width is, is, a, is a poor um, standard for buffer design, and it just depends on so many other factors. So this table um, just is a, is a literature review showing the width of riparian zones for birds. And it just goes to show that there's a ton of variation and there's really no magic number. You know, some studies say you need only 40 meters to protect bird habitat. And some say you need over 500 meters. So what this really means instead is that each stream needs a specialized plan. And buffers as small as 10 to 30 meters can help protect physical, chemical, and aquatic biological integrity in streams, things like nutrient removal, sediment trapping, erosion protection, temperature reduction in the water, uh, macro invert and fish communities. But a much wider buffer is likely needed for terrestrial habitat. So some other things we can think about are structure of the vegetation and having multiple layers and maybe incorporating some faster growing species in our restoration design and some slower growing species, as well as interspersing shrub patches within tree species when thinking about where to plant things. And then another important factor is the surrounding landscape type and the proximity of our buffer to those existing remnant habitats. So the surrounding landscape comes into play when we're thinking about site selection. And a study by Gardali and Holmes found that the rate of bird in abundance increases after restoration as a function of the number of tree species planted, so diversity, the number of stems planted in an area or density, and importantly, the percent riparian forest within 500 meters or how close that buffer is to other habitats to connect to. And other research right here in the Champlain Valley by UVM researchers um, came to the conclusion that habitats should be treated as um, a single integrated ecological unit in the whole stream system across spatial scales. And that's because birds respond to so many variables channel slope, drainage size, percent conifers, and in-stream conditions. So this really means that it's ideal to think about habitat restoration with a holistic approach. For our last question of how long it might take after a planting for birds to show up, um, this study looked at bird response to riparian buffers of varying ages, two, nine, and 14 years. And we can see with the three bars on the left here, much higher than the two on the right, abundance was higher in the buffers versus the control group, which is great in showing that restored areas provide habitat. However, when we think about richness and diversity, certain species might reflect successional stage. So just like forests where there's early pioneering species and then other species that come in later, a similar thing happens with birds. So the youngest buffer here shows the highest abundance, but the oldest buffer here shows the most rich and diverse communities. So you might see 
a high number of birds in it as little as two years, but you won't you might not see rich and diverse communities until much later. And these plots here just I wanted to use it as an example to show that each species will show a different rate of colonization. And although they have different response times among species, there does seem to be kind of like this sweet spot after 10 or 15 years where we really start to see bird abundance take off. So that might be an estimate that we can use for about when to expect to see these animals using a restored area. So some takeaways for bird friendly riparian restoration are try to favor sites close to existing habitat for connectivity, control or remove invasives as much as possible. Of course, wider, larger buffers are going to be better, uh, but there are lots of constraints with funding and landowners and other things and we restore as much as we can. When thinking about our design, try to consider vertical structure for birds, stem density, and interspersing shrub patches within trees to give this semi-open canopy. Try to be strategic about which superstar native species that you're planting. If you need a shrub, why not make it a berry producing high caterpillar hosting bird loving species? And then keep in mind that it often takes many years to see the impacts of habitat restoration on birds. Those are my sources. That's all I have. Thanks for hanging in with me. And thank you, Cassie and Bob, um, for those opening acts. Um, Bob talked a lot about you know setting the stage, what our natural communities look like. Cassie uh, talked a lot about our charismatic vertebrates, but I'm going to focus more on, I think, what Bob called the, the cryptic and hard to understand uh, invertebrates out there. Um, so let me share my screen with you. All right, and a second here. All right. Um, so like Elson mentioned, I am a contracted naturalist ecologist. Um, I'm hired each year by the Gund Institute at the University of Vermont to study pollinators in a variety of different settings, uh, solar fields, um, most recently agriculture. Um, and so I've been working a lot with Audubon Vermont on their bird and bee friendly farming initiative. Um, and a project I hopped onto in about 2019 was this long-term monitoring study down in the Intervale in Burlington. Um, and that study has been going on with the Gund Institute since 2013. Um, it's changed hands a few times with different grad students here and there, um, but they hired me to kind of oversee it uh, and sort of lead an analysis on what we found over the last 10 years or so. Um, so we are right in the middle of that analysis. We have a student working on it right now uh, as part of her thesis, Alyssa Zawawi. Um, so we're hoping to get some insight into some of this research that's been going on. Um, so I don't really have any solid you know, facts and figures to share with you. So we're just gonna focus on the fun stuff, which is the biology and the natural history of these you know, poorly understood animals. Um, We've already talked a lot about you know, what makes good riparian habitat and how to manage them well. Um, so I'm really gonna focus on the native bees and what their story is, how they move about the world. Cause I find, you know, if you have a basic understanding of them that makes the conservation just that much easier. It's no longer a list of plants that you have to, to plant or a list of conservation practices. It's really understanding these organisms and their needs. Um, and so these are just a few of the native bees I've encountered over the last few years as I've been surveying down in the interval. Um, so here is a map of Burlington's interval. Um, if you haven't been there, uh, definitely check it out. It's come up a lot today uh, for various reasons. There's a conservation nursery down there. There's a lot of great diversified organic farming going on down there. 
and a lot of interesting natural habitat, including um, a pretty substantial connected riparian corridor that goes all the way along the Winooski River here. So what we've been doing for the past um, almost 10 years now is uh, looking at farm sites and collecting bees three times per summer um, at a lot of the farms and, and the conservation nursery and Intervale Center down there and comparing that to some of the more natural habitats. So back in, in the back of the Intervale here, I call it the back, um, there's wetlands and grasslands. And then we've also got the, the riverbed up here and then the floodplain forest. Um, it's one of those silver maple ostrich fern floodplain forests on that sandy bank um, where we're also collecting bees. And hopefully we're going to compare you know, how some of the more human dominated landscapes um, compare in abundance and diversity to some of these natural landscapes and what that means economically for some of these farms. Um, but first I'm gonna give my little honeybee spiel for those of you who aren't familiar with the difference between native bees and honeybees. Um, so this is the European honeybee, Apis mellifera. Um, this is just a, a video I shot down in the interval a couple of years ago on a dandelion. Um, and so honeybees are non-native. Uh, I wouldn't go as far as to call them invasive, but they are a domesticated animal. Um, the USDA regards them as livestock. And they were introduced sometime in the 1600s for honey production. And since then, their economic importance has really shifted as more of a pollination service. And the reason for that is we've largely eliminated the habitat of native bees. And now we rely on honeybees quite a bit in um, most of our you know, more conventional agriculture. And the reason for that is they are sort of a one size fits all generalist pollinator. They will pollinate most things. Um, they're not as good at it as some of the native bees, as um, I'll mention later on. Uh, but they can, you know, they can pollinate most things. You put it out there, and they will pollinate your blueberries and your apples. Um, maybe not as efficiently as some of the natives, but they'll do it. Um, so it really is sort of a utilitarian, um, domesticated animal that we use for honey and for pollination services. And usually when I ask people to name a pollinator, the first thing they think of is the honeybee. So I like to get that right out of the way. Um, and then the next pollinator, if I ask for someone to think of one off the top of their head, is usually the bumblebee. Um, so we have about a little over a dozen bumblebee species here in Vermont. Um, and similarly to the honeybee, they are a social insect. Uh, or they're more on the primitive end of the social scale. They form very small colonies, make a small amount of honey, um, but they are native uh, and that is the big difference. Um, and usually people think of bumblebees when I ask about pollinators because they're big, they're charismatic. Farmers often see them on their crops. They're kind of hard to miss, especially in the early spring when there aren't many insects out, you see these giant queens flying around. So bumblebees are you know, another one of those kind of poster children for the, the pollinator, um, for most of our native pollinators. And they are economically very important. And I'll talk about that uh, later on. But uh, again, usually people name honeybees, then bumblebees, and then they struggle to think of even a third species of bee. Um, and in reality, we have more than 300 species of native bees in Vermont. I think the number is up to 326 now. Um, and comparatively, we have 4,000 species of bees in the US as a whole. So you know, of those 4,000 species, 75% are solitary, which means they don't form colonies, they don't make honey, they don't have a big social structure. They are just you know, kind of like birds in the sense that they have one female raising a clutch of eggs and a single brood. Um, and so that is the, lar the vast majority of bees. Again, we tend to think of honeybees and bumblebees, um, but they're sort of outliers when you look at most bee species worldwide. 15% um, of uh, bees in the US at least are kleptoparasites, also known as cuckoo bees. Um, I'm not really gonna talk about them much, um, but they're often indicators of a pretty healthy bee population. They're you know, 
infiltrating the nests of other solitary bees, uh, just like a cuckoo bird would. Um, and then 10% of bees are social. So uh, these are like your bumblebees, your honeybees, they have colonies um, and a social structure. So uh, again, we only have about a little more than a dozen uh, bumblebee species here in Vermont, uh, which means there are 300 plus species of solitary bees out there that we really know little about. Um, and we're just starting to learn. People say that you know, bee conservation is now where bird conservation was 100 years ago, where we just got our, fir our very first bee field guide. No field guide existed until a few months ago. Um, and so we really are sort of behind the times when it comes to understanding native bees. Um, and what we've learned so far in the interval um, is really, you know, it's one of the best long-term monitoring studies in the state that, that I know of. Um, and we're really excited to see what some of these results look like. Um, so I like to give this comparison here of, you have your honeybee over here and all of your, your native bees. Um, and then I, I like to compare it to bird conservation where um, we do have an example of a domesticated non-native bird and that is the chicken. Um, and I kind of compare the honeybee to the chicken. Um, I've heard this from a number of uh, native bee researchers. I didn't come up with this analogy myself. Um, but really when you think about native bee conservation, honeybees really don't have anything to do with it. And so, you know, when someone's like, wow, I wanna go out and save the bees and then they start keeping bees. It's a really, it's totally different. It's as if somebody was like, wow, I really wanna save the birds. So I'm gonna go out and start raising chickens. Um, they're really not tied to each other. The jury is still kind of out on whether or not honeybees present any sort of um, detriment to native bees when it comes to competition. I have heard arguments both for and against it. I've heard that you know there is some benefit from the competition, but uh, they're really not invasive um, and we really don't call them invasive. So just think of them like livestock, like anything else. Um, so what makes riparian areas so, uh, you know, such great refugia for a lot of these native bees and specifically for the native bees that are declining the fastest, the specialists, um, really it's the, the, the silver bullet here, I think is the, the early bloom times. So Bob mentioned uh, silver maple is a really um, integral component to a lot of these riparian communities, a lot of the floodplain forests. Silver maples and red maples both bloom very early. And I was just out in the interval last week and the silver maples were already blooming. So that means that bees have to be out somewhere. There are specialist bees that will come out as soon as their, um, the flower they specialize on blooms. Uh, so any, any day where it's above 55, 60 degrees, you'll start seeing these early, early bees emerging. Um, and then willows are the other one. They've come up time and time again through, throughout the day. Um, and these are some photos I took a couple years ago of the first bees of the season. So these are male andrina. The males emerge before the females, so they're out waiting on the flowers um, for the females to come visit. And uh, they are on, this is actually at Mackenzie Park, um, right along the bank there. And these are as soon as the, the willows flower, you can hear them before you see them. You, as you're walk, approaching a willow, you'll hear the bees just, uh, it'll be totally covered in any, any bees that are out at that moment. So we have a lot of uh, Andrina, these are the mining bees that specialize on willow and red maple and silver, silver maple. Um, we also have a, a number of these bees in the same genera that are generalists. So not only are they out visiting the, the maples and the willows, but as soon as crops start flowering, like some of those early ones like blueberry, they're going to be going visiting those as well. So that's where this uh, becomes important economically, which I'll get to in a little, uh, in a few slides. Um, another thing that makes riparian habitat so special are the, the soils. And Bob alluded to those sandy, silty soils that you often find on floodplains. So you might initially think riparian habitat, it's wet, there's a lot of water and flooding involved, 
how could ground nesting bees um, make it in an environment like that? And like I mentioned earlier, 75% of bees nest in the ground. So they've come up with all sorts of different strategies. My favorite is the, the cellophane bee, also known as, or Kalides, the, the common name is cellophane bee. Um, and so th these are some photos and videos I took, again, down in the interval. Um, and this is on some coyote scat, and this is very early in the spring. And you'll often find aggregations of bees and moths and butterflies on coyote scat or any scat that they can find. They're looking for electrolytes um, to fuel their flight muscles. And in the early spring, it's really hard to find electrolytes. So they kind of aggregate on these scat piles. Um, and the cellophane bee, uh, they will nest right in the sandy bank and they're among the first to come out. Again, there's some of these specialists on willows and, and silver maple and red maple. And they, uh, their strategy, they're called cellophane bees because they actually collect floral oils and make a plastic-like material that they use to line their nests. Um, and so this is a photo of that. I didn't take this, uh, I got this from a paper. But uh, this is that plastic-like material, and they use that to protect against frequent flooding. Um, and the reason why sandy and silty soils are so important to, to bees is that it drains rather quickly. So you can have frequent flooding events, but they only have to withstand it for a short period of time because that will, will drain out and dry pretty quickly. Um, and so you tend to see bee diversity is directly correlated to um, the, the particle size in the soils. We, we look at, you know, nationwide uh, bee diversity is highest in like our arid desert climates um, because of the, the uh, abundance of sand there. Uh, so I think this is a really cool strategy by Kalides to, to withstand that flooding. Um, so another thing that makes riparian habitat so welcoming for bees, it, even if you do have saturated soils and you're sort of you know, closer to the water habitat end of the spectrum there, uh, you're, you're pretty likely to have snags. And snags are essential habitat for birds. Uh, we all know that they're easy to see, um, but they're also important habitat for insects. And after beetles visit the snags and, um, or even the live wood and bore these perfectly round holes, bees will use those as places to provision their nests. So there are a lot of cavity nesting solitary bees that uh, search for snags to, to make these, uh, these nests in. Um, and if there are no snags around in, in your particular riparian buffer, you can mimic this by putting in nest blocks. So a lot of times you'll see those artificial uh, blocks for solitary bees on a post or something like that. Um, this is one I built in my backyard a few years ago. It's really easy. You just drill holes in two by fours and they'll come to it. Um, and so this is a mason bee provisioning her nest. Uh, you can see the pollen on her abdomen there. Um, and so she rolls that pollen into a little ball and lays her egg on it for the larva to eat. Um, so you also have uh, leaf cutter bees that employ the same strategy. Uh, the only difference is the mason bees will use um, mud and dirt to cap their nests. So you can see that an example of that here. And then the leaf cutter bees will kind of mash up leaf material and use that to cap their nest. Um, so it's got that, when it's fresh, it's got that green look to it. And over time, it, um, it becomes more camouflaged. Uh, and then you also have resin bees, which will use pine sap. So occasionally you'll see that as well. Um, so something else that makes riparian habitat so special for bees are the abundance of pithy or hollow stemmed plants. Um, mostly shrubs is, is where I see this. So elderberry uh, here on the left is a great shrub for this. Um, raspberry is another one. Uh, anything, uh, any rubus really with that hollow or pithy stem. Um, and sumac is actually uh, in the interval. It's like every single sumac I look at, if there is a dead branch somewhere, you know, underneath the living foliage, there will be an entrance hole in there for these small carpenter bees, Ceratina, to nest in. Um, and that is a, a very common plant that I see that on. So sumacs, rubus, elderberry, great plants for these stem nesting bees. 
Um, so this is an example of a sumac that I took from the interval a couple of years ago, split it down the middle, and I could see an old nest where it had been provisioned. Um, and you can pop out the larvae, look at them. These are some overwintering adults. And if you're careful about splitting these open, if I like to kind of shave it off with a, a razor blade. And if you're careful not to damage any of the larvae or the adults, you can put them right back in and tape it up and they're none the wiser. Um, they will emerge as if nothing happened in the spring. Um, so back to the interval, uh, talked a little bit about what makes that habitat so, spe so special for native bees. Um, like I said, we don't have our analysis totally done yet, but just anecdotally, I see um, a, a pretty big shift throughout the season. So uh, riparian habitat tends to be really good for some of those early emerging bees. Um, and it's particularly important because when bumblebees wake up in April, late April usually, uh, they'll be visiting a lot of those early flowering plants like willows and, um, and red maples and silver maples. And that will allow them to build bigger colonies throughout the season um, and more workers. So what I tend to see is in the early spring at my sampling sites that are along the floodplain forest here and along the banks of the Winooski, uh, that's where I see the highest abundance and diversity of bees. Um, and these sort of back farms towards the, the wetland area are, are you know, few and far between. But as the season progresses and the summer, you know, takes off in earnest and you have kind of your, your peak bloom time, uh, there's a shift. The, the, like the riverbank is a bit quieter. There's not quite as much abundance and diversity. Um, and really the hot spot then is, is somewhere in like in the community gardens area, but you get the, the goldenrod and the Joe pie weed and a lot of the, the plants flowering back there. Um, so really the riparian buffers support those early emerging pollinators and then get the generalists off to a really good start. Um, and again, if you just go and walk down in the interval uh, and take a look at the landscape down there, you know, these are photos that, that I lifted from the Xerces Society manual attracting native pollinators. Um, you know, this is exactly what those, that landscape looks like down in, in the interval. Um, sometimes I swear they did the sketches down there, especially this one up here. Um, but the takeaway here is if you manage for the specialists, um, if you're providing those early blooming native plants and the late blooming native plants too, and you're, um, like Cassie said, putting the time into eliminating the invasives from these buffers and, and really enhancing them, you're managing for these specialists, but the generalists will also benefit. And the generalists, like our bumblebees and even our honeybees, um, are what we consider most economically important. So if you have riparian habitat here right next to like a blueberry field, you could expect to see, you know, an increase in pollination services. And this was actually um, from a study of, from a few years back by a PhD student at the Gund, uh, Charlie Nicholson. Um, and he looked at, at wild bee pollination and blueberry crops and found that over 80 species of bees pollinate blueberries Again, we tend to see just the bumblebees because they're the big charismatic ones. And indeed, they are doing the most work. But last year, we had a, a weird year where we had very few bumblebee queens out and people were really alarmed by it and thought that the blueberry crops would fell all over the place. And it turns out a lot of these other bees, these mining bees, Andrina, kind of picked up the slack and were pollinating at um, greater rates than usual. So that's where diversity becomes really important here. Um, you have these sort of refute, refugia for diverse assemblages of native bees right next to where you're growing your crops. Um, you sort of have a, a fallback plan where if any one of these um, species suffers some sort of decline, you have a bunch of other species that can pick up the slack. Um, so just like to acknowledge the Gund Institute, um, Audubon, Vermont, who's been a partner in, in this Burden Bee Friendly Farming uh, initiative going forward, uh, funded by the Linflack Foundation. And uh, I just want to give a shout out to Vermont Center for Eco Studies. Uh, they have been uh, helping us a great deal in identifying all of our bees. Uh, you know, 
almost 10 years worth of specimens, we have thousands of bees to identify. And most of them, you have to like pull their tongues out or look at their genitalia and stuff like that. And um, they, uh, we, the Vermont Center for Eco-Studies, we have sort of a symbiotic relationship with them where they are identifying the bees for us. And in turn, we're sharing our data with them for the, the statewide atlas to help understand native bee distributions better across the state. And then the Intervale Center, um, they're not like an official partner, but they're always there helping us, giving me permission to walk around swinging that every year um, and really just listen to everything we have to say. They've been super curious about the whole process. Um, all right. Well, thank you, everyone. And uh, I guess it's time for questions. Yep. Um, yeah, we have a little bit of time for questions. We are technically supposed to start the next session at 2.30, but I think we're gonna, um, our presenter for that session says she has a little bit of flexibility. So I think we're gonna take a little bit of time to do just a couple of questions here. And then there are some questions that are already in the chat. So if y'all wanna take a look at those and answer those um, typing, that would be great. And then we could take, if anybody has a question they wanna ask verbally, we can do that. So do we have any questions? Um, I can try to take a stab at this first one from Astrid, who sure. asked, um, do you have any biodiversity monitoring methods that you would suggest for riparian buffers? Um, and it's kind of funny, um, Audubon and a bunch of watershed groups and partners have been kind of brainstorming some things to include in what would be a good monitoring method. And we definitely discussed um, using water quality metrics. Um, over time, of course, probably um, soil samples, uh, looking at vegetation, and um, one of the most common bird monitoring methods is point count surveys over time. Um, but because you know a lot of the results after restoration will not appear in the data for many many years, um, there's a lot that goes into it, and I don't have much more detail than that. Great. And then there was also a question here um, about the best method to get rid of honeysuckle. Um, I don't know if anybody um, who presented has a good answer for that, or also we can open it up to the larger group and see if anybody else on the call does. Um, I mean, I know the method that Audubon tends to use is a grind and then a stump treatment. So we'll cut with whatever right at the base, maybe a few inches above the soil surface. And then um, if you remember in one of the photos using the buckthorn blaster, it's kind of like a bingo dauber bottle with a sponge at the tip. So you can be super targeted about how much you're using and where exactly that uh, glyphosate based herbicide is going. And it's also dyed so you can see where you've hit and where you've missed. Um, and that's pretty good at reducing um, regeneration of that species. Great, thanks so much, Cassie. Um, so if there, there were a couple other quick questions I think you guys can address in the chat. One was about the, um, the authors of the book you, the field guide you brought up, Jason. And then the other one was just listing a few different types of bees, which I do think at that point, maybe Jason, you got to in your, just so we can all sound uh, smarter when we're talking about, <laughs> when we're talking about bees. So, um, and I did want to say, um, this is, I didn't plan this, but the second plug for my podcast, the podcast that the Watershed Forestry Partnership runs. So, um, Jason was, uh, a guest for an episode that we did about, um, bees and pollinators in riparian forest habitats. So if you're interested in learning even more, he shared a lot of really great information today, and there's even more in the podcast. Um, it's on the Watershed Forestry Partnership website on our podcast tab. 